Okay, all right. So we're going for a midterm, right? So last midterm is uh, released next Monday, due next Tuesday night. Again, there will be very similar to the homework level of difficulty, but then there can also be like homework that could be long questions, right? So prepare for question with multiple parts, prepare for a lot of circuit calculations. Right, so covers, you know, so the midterm will cover up to end of class, uh, end of last class. So to be specific, this covers up to the active power calculation for type three. So last time we did, we uh, you know, worked through all the charts, the diagram with all the possible active power definitions, calculation, all that. So midterm will have to come up to there. The reactive power uh, calculation, which we'll continue to talk about today, that's a little bit more natural to be covered together with type four. So that will, sort of, will be covered on the final. Okay. So it'll be calculation of type three. The solution for this week's homework will be released on Saturday. And once you guys hand it on Friday, we'll release it. We'll release the solution. Then you'll get some practice questions about type three with solutions attached. Okay, but those are, but type three is definitely a part. You'll see at least one question about type three. Okay, so you'll see some question about type three and then questions about all the others. Yeah, good. So a question will probably be uh, seven or eight, depending on whether you're grad or undergrad. So again, there will be a question just for grad students. So I don't know who's grad here, but you'll get a question. Okay. Yeah, should you take you about two and a half to three hours to do? So it's as if you're doing class, right? It should take you about that long. Again, make use of uh, computer software. Right? Those will be long equations. It will be you know things that you have to graph to find a solution. Okay, so make use of that. Uh, yeah, so you. Uh, no. Okay. no, no, no. Yeah. <laughs> Monday will be released around 4 p.m., let's say, 4 ish, around 4 ish. Yeah. yeah, so we're making it now, then I want, I want the grader to check it before releasing. So around Monday, 4 ish. Any other questions? Okay, all right. So, you know, with us, uh, don't copy. Don't copy people. It's really, really easy to figure it out if you copy from each other. But it's not, we can't figure it out. So we don't bother to catch it yet. But no, if there's sort of very uh, clear people are sharing answers, then, then, then we'll sort of follow up on that. But you know, otherwise, don't copy. Take your time, do the questions. And then again, it'll be very similar to the whole. The style of the questions will be very similar to the whole. Yeah. yeah, so the class will be office hours. Yeah. Is there any class hours? There's no dedicated office hours, but you know, email is definitely fine. Right. So, but if your email, you know, no, it takes me a couple of hours to reply. You can keep that in mind. So it's really so. I do encourage you to at least look at it Monday night. Right? At least look at it. Right? Okay, so especially if you email me, you know, Tuesday at six, the chance of you getting a reply is not good. Right? So that's just, uh, so you plan, you plan out, you know, take time to when you want to do that, just uh, find time to do that. Other questions about the midterm? Okay, so the midterm, I will grade it, right? So and uh, definitely for sort of partial grades will be given. It's not looking for the, Almost all the final answers will have some bucks in it. Right? If you forgot to divide by root three or you forgot to multiply by two, things like that. So show your steps. Right? So if the equations are mostly correct, you'll get most of the thing. Okay. Good. But do show your stuff. Okay. So if you, you know, if you don't show your stuff, then I'll just look at the final number and see whether that's right. Okay. All right, so... Uh, Okay, so yeah, so that's a midterm again, short step. So don't write on the midterm. This comes from slide five of this class. 
and I got this answer. Okay? So that's not a good way of showing your answer. Okay, so show all the stuff, show all the stuff. Okay, so again, you know, you can, as long as you don't communicate with each other, you can use whatever you want. Okay, you want to Google stuff, you can Google stuff. Okay, so that's up to you. Right, so continue on with type three, right? So last time we talked about active power. So we look at active power, the modification is we still have a circuit. So this is our circuit. So this is R1, X1, X2 prime, R2 prime over S. And then what changes for active power, uh, this uh, they we have a V, let's say VA2 prime over S. Right? So this VA2 prime is this injected voltage. And to compute active power, all the equations really don't change that much as your current calculation is a bit different because you have another voltage source on the right hand side. After that, everything's the same. You just find the current and uh, compute all the active powers. So for reactive power, it's a bit different. Okay, so for reactive power, this is not the only circuit we look at. We have to look at some other circuit. With the reason being that if you look at reactive power, so So if you think of this as, as a motor, this is a connection to the grid. We have a rotor side converter. We have a grid side converter. So this is our, so for reactive power, there's significant power flow in the two converters. And in addition, what happens for reactive power is you have to take this transmission line into it. So for active power, what you do is you can compute the power coming out here, then that will be the power that gets here. So losses along this transmission line path, this is typically very small compared to every other resistive loss in the circuit. So you can, you know, it suffices to think of this as a voltage source and compute active power here. Reactive power is a bit different. Because reactive power along the line is significant. Okay? So you have to think of this as not directly attached to the grid, but there is a transmission line. And that matters for reactive power. Okay? So when we talk about losses in the system, like the active power loss along a transmission line is typically not very large. Reactive power is quite a bit large. Okay? So that's why when we talk reactive power, we have to think about two things. One is I have some reactive power coming out of this rotor side converter here. I have some other reactive power coming out this way, the gray side converter. When you think about how much reactive power is dissipated along the line. Okay. So the line matters for reactive power. Okay. So that's why, so last time, what we looked at was the reactive power flow through the rotor side converter. Where basically the calculation was, well, you know, you have some uh, QR, reactive power being injected. And then that gets lost through Q1, Q2, and uh, Qn. So if we look at the grid side converter, now I was thinking about, okay, after you go through this converter, you go through the transformer, then what happens to active and reactive power? Okay, how much active power and reactive power go through this power flow? Okay. So we'll care about the active power flow here, and the reactive power through this converter. And normally there is a transformer sitting on this end. Okay, so normally there'll be a transformer. So we'll talk about voltage at this end being V out prime because there goes to a transformer. So we won't worry too much about the transformer ratio of the transformer. Just know so this is typically a higher voltage than this V out. Okay, so you step up the voltage for the transformer. All right, so this is our transformer. And uh, so let's actually, let me do this in more steps. Okay, so what, so after the transformer, what do we have? Well, we have something that has VL prime after the transformer. So this is, we have a gray side transformer, converter, a VL prime. We have a, some inductance, 
Okay, we'll have some inductance. So the line and the transformer together will have some inductance. So let's say this has value of x. And then this gets to the grid side. This goes to the grid. So this is called form. So FCB stands for form collection bus. So what this point models is you have multiple wind turbines. They all connect to the grid through the same bus. Okay, so electrically, this is a your connection to the grid and it's called the farm collection bus. So all the farm gets clocked together, goes to the grid through that bus. Okay. All right, so, so this, we can think of that as grid or think of as you know, some fixed voltage point. Okay, so let's say here I have some voltage, right? V, F, C, B. Here I have some, other, I have some voltage V out. So we want to compute how much power flows through this transmission. We okay, have some VL prime coming out of the grid side converter. It's connected to the grid through a transmission line. So this goes back to the 351 basic calculations is you have two voltages along a line, how much power flows through. Okay. So this is, so, have, so we all have done this calculation for many times. So let's say this, this is voltage V out angle delta. So it's very, so it's common to take this voltage as angle zero, again, this grid, yes, the grid is angle zero. So this is the same voltage as V1. Okay, so this typically the same voltage as V1. So this is some, reactants with value X. And uh, let's say we want to compute the current. After the current, we want to compute the power. Right? We want to compute the power, okay? how much power is flowing. So the injected power, right? so you know, PR, remember our power flow, PR is some power that's being, that's the active power flowing through the converters. Because this law is lossless, right? this line is lossless, it's the same amount of power that gets the grid. Right? There's no losses along the line. This is a purely uh, reactive line. So the reactive power uh, can change. So the, again, GSC stands for grid set converter. The reactive power definitely is not the same at both ends of the law. So depending on what the voltages are and what value of X is, reactive power will change. So that's a cal calculation we'll do. So the current, right? So the current again is a very standard calculation. V out angle delta minus VFCB over JX. This is the current. So anybody remember sort of how we want to write this out? So there's a particular way we want to write out this current. Anybody remember the power flow along a lossless line? What does active power depend on? What does reactive power depend on? Okay, there's a okay. Right. right, so what we want to do is we want to recover this sort of intuition we may remember as active power depend on the sign of the angle. Reactive power depend on the voltage and the cosine. Right? So that you'll see that that equation comes up a lot in this. So let's uh, do this again. Okay, so the reason that happens is writing this out in polar coordinates or in rectangular coordinates. x right so i have cosine delta plus j sine delta minus uh, vfcb collect terms okay, collect terms here 
So we have VR prime over X sine delta plus J VFCB minus V of cosine over X. Okay, so this separates all the two terms, right? So we have the real part depending on the sine, the imagined part depending on the sort of difference of the voltage and cosine. So that's the two terms we have. And now we want to compute the now we want to compute the power flow, right? This is current, we want to compute power. And the power we care about, okay? So there's two powers we can compute. We can either compute the power coming out of the converter, or we can compute the power going into the grid. So there's two powers. So what we want is let's now compute the power going into the grid. Let's compute how much power is going into the grid. So the power going into the grid is S. Okay, so this is the complex power, voltage times current conjugate. Okay, so don't forget the conjugate. In the, especially in the midterm, do not forget the conjugate. It's a very common mistake, especially if you're using a computer program, you sort of forgot to, you forget to conjugate the curve. Okay, always conjugate the curve. Right? So check to make sure you, you have this conjugate. So the active power again doesn't change, just PR. This is by sort of by notation we have. Okay, so let's write out equations for these. Right. So if we write out the equation, well, so this equation is particularly easy because this is just a uh, three times V FCB times the conjugate of the current. So you leave the first part alone, you conjugate the second part. So we get PR as three V out Delta Q is so these are just the equations. Okay, so by so this tells you you pick the angle, this will set PR, and then the angle determines also determines the reactive power flow. Okay. Okay. So any questions for this calculation? Then we talk about why this is very important in the type three generally. Okay. So this is important because right, so all of these things are connected together. So remember this injective power goes into the active power calculation. So it has to do with the develop power, has to do with air gap power, all this dependency. Right. To make sure all the sequence are consistent, you basically you got to choose two things. You got to choose this angle against after power electronic converter. So this angle is free. You can choose this. This voltage is typically pretty set. So this voltage you don't change very much. It's after it's before transformer. So it's after transformer. So this voltage is typically pretty set. So your job is basically choose this angle to make sure this PR works out the way you want. But then this also impacts your reactive power. So this angle sort of impacts many things. And in practice, is you choose the angle to get the right trade-off. Basically, let's say you want to you know, minimize reactive power, the uh, generator consumed from the grid. So you want to make this large. Right? One way to choose the angle is make this large. Then you think about, okay, what am I doing to this active power? Because the active power still makes sense. So all of these equations are connected together. It's not like you can choose two paths a powerful independently from each other. Okay, there is the active because this active power is always conserved. This puts a constraint on how much reactive power can flow out of the other branch. Okay, so there are constraints to this. Okay, questions? Okay. 
Okay, so all those constants because again, this voltage typically you cannot change too much. In our power systems, the voltage levels are pretty set. Okay, so if you could choose both voltage and angle independently or arbitrarily, then you can suffer for power flow. You can you know keep your active power the same, change your active power however you want. So because you cannot choose voltage all that independently, all these things are connected. All right, so in a lot of homework questions, you see sort of, again, you'll see assumptions that may not be really realistic. Like we'll make an assumption, you know, you change one number, the other number stays the same. In reality, all of these equations are coupled. But then again, you don't want to solve five couple equations to get homework question. Right? You'll see a lot of these assumptions. In practice, you know, everything will change a little bit if you change some of them. Okay. Any other questions? So these are the power flows. So when you when we do the so at the end, what we do is we'll collect all these power flows together. So sum of all the terms on the set. So what is the net power outflow? Okay. So these equations are typed out here. If you want the reference, so just typed out equations. And then basically this gives us a guideline of uh, you know, are you providing reactive power through this path? Are you, uh, you know, consuming reactive power or is the reactive power zero? So if you want to provide reactive power support, right? You often want to make sure this is large. You want to provide reactive power support. So it depends on the operation of the uh, generator. Okay, so let's do an example. Let's do an example. Now sort of put things together. Okay. So let's say I have a, again, a DFIG, so it's type three system, six pole, 60 hertz, one connector generator of a terminal voltage, 690 volts. Yeah. And then we'll have a bunch of uh, builder parameters of this. And then one is, let's assume there's no injection, let's compute the value power. That if we increase, so this is showing us how do we regulate the speed through injection. So if the speed now changes, we want to maintain the, the devolved power to be constant. So remember in type two, the way we did this is we changed the added resistance. So here we're not gonna add a resistance, we're gonna inject a voltage. Okay, we're gonna inject a voltage. So to make things easy, to make things easy, I'm gonna give, so the problem is gonna give you the angle of the voltage. Okay, so instead of solving for a complex number, I just solve for one number. I just solve for the magnitude. Okay, so that's the idea for this. So let me do this. Okay, so again, in practice, what you would do is you solve for both magnitude and the angle. But here we're gonna just to solve for the magnitude first. Okay, so we have all these parameters. Okay, we have all these parameters. So to make our life easy, let's say we'll ignore. Okay, so let's ignore XM for now to make the calculation a bit easier. Okay, so then our circuit is VA1, R1, X1. X2 prime, R2 prime over S. There's no injected voltage yet, right? So first let's do this calculation without injected voltage. So this is our circuit. So this is IA2. So the slip is N S minus N over N S. Zero to five. Okay. There's our slip. And then now we're going to compute the current and compute the developed power. So current, this is, or I guess let's just compute the magnitude of the current, VA1, R2S squared plus S1 plus. 
Okay, so this is just the magnitude of the current. Okay, so after we compute the magnitude of the current, we can compute the Duval tau. Okay, so, so power is minus three R D I A two prime square. Okay, so remember this R D, right? Remember R D is a developed resistance, okay, in this equation. So R D is R to S one minus S. Okay, so this is definitely on top, right? So this because we have a slip, we set up this developed resistance. This developed resistance times current is a developed top. Okay. So this is the equation we'll use. Plug all these things as we get this is 976 kilowatts. Okay. Okay, Oh yeah, I forgot our one. Sorry. Sorry. Uh, oh, R one zero. R one. There's no R one. Yeah. R one zero. No one R one one. Yeah. R one zero. Okay. Any other questions? All right. So look at this. So again, because midterm is coming up, I'm going to talk about the common mistakes we see every time. So don't don't make them. You're here, right? So one is there's a rule three. This calculation, right? don't forget the rule three. Second is this is the RD. So very again, another common mistake is to put this R use the R two prime over S. Okay, that's another common mistake people do. As you compute the current, you think okay, this is the current going through R two prime over S, and this is the developed time. Right? So that's not the case. Okay, this is the de developed resistance. The R2 part is actually the copper loss. Okay, so this is the developed power part. The other R2 comes in because that's actually the loss in the system. Okay. So those are the two common mistakes right, in this calculation. And this actually, yeah, so this happens a lot. Then you'll be off by first a little bit. So you start to find instead of RD. Okay, any other questions? So, right, so this is the developed power. Then now let's say, hey, since now let's inject a voltage here and see what happens. Okay. So when we inject a voltage, so everything else stay the same. So no R1. Okay, let's try this. One x to prime, R2 prime over S. Now we get a voltage injection. Right? Now there's a voltage injection. With voltage amplitude, A2 prime, VA2 prime, with the angle of minus 180 degrees. So this is minus 180 because the question specifically says this is 180 degrees out of phase. All right, so this is, so now given this calculation is basically, we want to solve for this magnitude. Okay, so the phase is given, solve for this magnitude. Okay. Okay, so one, if it's 180 degrees out of phase, it doesn't matter if it's minus or plus one. Yeah, it's just minus one. So it's 180 degrees out of phase. So everything else stays the same, except the IA2 calculation. So now this calculation changes, right? It changes because we have VA2 prime over S angle minus 180 okay, minus VA1 divided by sort of the same thing we have as before, R2 prime S squared plus S1 plus S2 prime. So we have this IAT from, uh, from, because we have this injected voltage at this end. So what's the angle minus 180? What is that? Negative VA2 prime, this is negative one. So this is negative VA2 prime. Okay. So you want to put this in, you can put this number thing. Again, all this is created to make this a real number. So this magnitude calculation comes up sometimes. Okay, so 
doesn't have to go this way, but this is a number that's chosen to make everything simple. So there's minus VA2 prime S minus VA1 over this thing. So now let's compute the develop. Okay, so now let's compute the develop the voltage, the develop power, and then you equate that to what we had before, and then solve for V. Okay, that's where the goal we have, right? Okay, so and this gets a bit complicated for the following reason. So first of all, S changes, right? So let's so remember, we need to do this because S has changed. So S has changed. Okay, so S has changed. And now we need to compute the develop power part for the uh, develop power part for the system with injection. Okay. So if you recall, if you recall the equations for develop power. Okay, so now develop power has two parts. Okay. So now if you remember develop power for this uh, for this system with injection. Now the equation is minus three R D. I2 prime square, this is the same as before. What else do we have in this develop power, develop power equation? There's an additional part to it. Right? Because now you have two sources of power. One source of power comes because you have a negative resistance being developed. Another source of power comes from because you're injecting voltage. So there's a voltage times curve part in this half, okay? So there's another part to this. This we have plus three real part of VAT prime S, one minus S, IAT prime star, right? So there's a two parts of the develop power. Again, when we have injections, because we have a slip, both things happen. You set up a developed resistance here. Because you have slip, also we have this VA2 prime time over S times one minus. So there's two parts to this developed power equation, right? So that is something to remember. Any question up to here? Good. Yeah. This is a magnitude. Okay. Right, so for magnitude, this is, uh, right, so let me think about Yeah, I should be more careful with this because, yeah, so ideally you want to take the absolute value. So this doesn't matter because we're gonna square it. So this wouldn't matter at the end, but you're right. Yeah. So I need to be careful, more careful. But it's okay, but at the end of all, we're gonna, we're gonna square this. So that will be better, okay. When we do this calculation, we'll actually do the complex curve. So here we do the complex curve. That's a good point. Okay. So yeah, so up to here, right? So we have two parts for the power. Okay, so this question, we got two parts for the power. Okay. So then again, if you do your homework, you get to this point, this is pretty good. The rest is solving this equation, which is not, there's sort of a lot of parts to this. So we're gonna compute this. Again, we're scoring that, so that's okay. This is the negative sign is okay. But now we need to compute the actual complex part takes the complex conjugate, multiply this thing. Okay. So what do we have? Well, we need to look at the different, the sort of the real part of this expression. Okay, we need to look at the real part of, of this expression. So the, I2 prime as a complex current, right, as the complex current, this is just VA2 prime over S minus VA1, R2 over S plus JX1 plus X2 prime. Okay. 
So this is a complex current we have. And uh, we want to get some expression for the second curve. So when you do this problem, for example, you have you access to a computer, what you would do is now you start graphing respect to VA2 prime. Okay, you pick some VA2 prime, you just graph, you put it into this equation, you just graph it until you see this equals to the null power. Okay, so if you have access to a computer, this is the way you will solve the problem. Okay, you wouldn't. There's, you don't necessarily need to get this to be something that's analytical. You can work with. So we're going to do it because in this problem we can. And uh, sorry, some, uh, there's, sort of, there's remind, the circuit is not too difficult to get this. But when you're doing this, it's, now it's okay. Once you know this equation, for each value of this V2 prime here, you can at least evaluate this thing. You can evaluate this thing, add them up until you get the, Give us how you want. Read it all from the graph, get your VH. Okay, so that's exactly. Okay. So now, so when you solve this, one way to do it is simply take VH prime here. You graph it from zero to some number that you want. You have a developed power we computed from before. The curve will look something like this, and then you read off. This is the number. This is the number you want. You can read off this number to be the number you want. Okay, so you can read it off here. Okay, so. And there, that's a reason why you're not asking be varying over both the magnitude and the end. Okay, so this allow gives you a single variable by just changing the single variable again. You value this, graph it, read it off whenever it causes you know, develop power, and that's a VA to you. So here we'll do a slightly more. We'll do some more work to get an analytical expression for this. But again, if you're doing it, you can, there's this graphing it and the reading off is a perfectly okay way of doing it. Okay. All right, so now because this problem again is set up fairly easily, we can actually compute, we can actually compute what the real and the imaginary part of the current is and actually put the, just write out this equation. So this PD equation, you can write it out. Right? So that's, we're gonna try that. So I2 prime, if you look at this, what happens is this is real number, real number, real number, this is the only complex number. So it's very easy to write this out into real plus imaginary. Okay. So we can write this out into real plus imaginary by multiplying the conjugate of the denominator. So if you just, Sort of multiply by the conjugate. This is the real imaginary part. Minus j x one plus x two. We can write this out. Okay, so after writing this out, because what we want is we want the real part of VA2 prime S minus S times IA2 star conjugate. Right? So because VA2 prime, this is a real number. This is a real number. This part is a real number. This comes the IA2 phi has the real and complex form. So when you multiply and take the real part, all you do is you pick up this real part. Okay, so that's the next step of the trick, right? This is entirely real. Again, that's the reason we said the angle to be negative 180. For this thing, come out to be entirely real number. This is a complex number, so you want a real part, it's just a real part multiplied by the real part. Okay, so that's, that's the part we have. 
Right. So if we do this, then you're so this just gets the real part. So this is VA2. Okay, so we do this, we get PD. So this we have from before, I2 prime squared, minus three VA2 prime S1 minus X. So this is the whole equation we get. Those terms come from the real part of this multiplication. This is the divide power we have from the current going through the divide resistance. Okay, and then now we can set this number to be equal to the divide power we had before. Okay, so then now we can set this. Right. So what's the good thing about this? This is quadratic in VA2. Okay, so the nice thing is this is a quadratic number. There is no, right, there is, the only thing we have is, uh, it's a quadratic number, the only two, we only have VA2 prime multiplied by VA2 prime. It's a quadratic in VA2 prime, so this is a quadratic equation. We can solve quadratic equations. Right? There's, we know how to solve this quadratic equation, so we can solve, right? Take the real number, take the actual number, we get VA2 prime, this is 26.9. Okay, so this is actually the, the way you can do it entirely analytically. You don't need to graph this, right? Any questions about this approach? So the quantum, yeah, go ahead. Just for the overall, so if we yeah. were the original question was asking for us to find the same developed power. Right, so yeah, so we're gonna plug in the developed power we got here. So 976, right. we're gonna have this thing equal to 976 kilopass. Right, so the V2 prime that gives the same developed power. So we're gonna solve this totally. Yeah. No, IE2 prime is a function of VA2. Yeah, so everything is square. Right? So you got a very two square. There's a lot of squares. Yeah, there's a lot of squares for VA2. Okay. So, but it is quadratic. So you collect terms, you can use the, you know, the formula to solve them. Okay. Yeah, I do not suggest going through this way. I do not suggest writing this thing out, collecting all the terms, and doing it that way. Like there's, you know, Good chance. Right. Yeah. Yeah. Right. Look at the intersection with this number. Right. So I wouldn't even suggest writing out this part. I would just directly do the you know, three real time, real part of the voltage time current. There's no reason to write out this part. Either, right? So, right. So, before the pandemic, that's what we had to do in the final because there's, there's, you don't have computers. So you have to solve this thing on the final and nobody would ever get the final answer across. Okay, so it's a, yeah. But there's something uh, sort of approximate what would happen in practice. So this is what we made people do. So that's why the midterm and final are now still take home. It doesn't make sense for you to do this in real time. Like what is the point of writing out all the terms and calculating this? Right, so that's why you should just graph this. But, That's yes, right. but that will require you to optimize over also the angle. Right. So, the, okay, sorry, you can do it through the grid, but you have to think, think of the loss. So that's sort of a harder equation here, a longer, even longer equation. And in practice, what you really want is you want to both keep this constant, also change the reactive power setting. And now you have to optimize over also over the angle. And that's a, too, that's a difficult question, even if you could graph. Now there are two dimensions. There's the magnitude and the angle you have to solve. And that's for optimizing over a complex variable, which is really for many things can go wrong. 
you know, of violation. Okay, so most questions will just you know make you do this. It's already a lot of steps. There's a lot of, already quite a number of steps. But this is a typical uh, question for this because really for type three is to take advantage of the fact that I have this injective. All right, I have this injective voltage. I want to solve injective voltage to get this to be constant with the benefit that you know, different than type two is I'm not losing power to add a resistance. Right? There's no power, additional power loss. Okay? So you're not being less efficient in that regard. Okay? Any questions about this calculation? I guess the type three typically will have log calculations because again, right, we're doing things backwards. So there's the setting up equations, solving the equation for some number. It really, really is, you know, when you do this stuff here and this plot, stuff like this one, there's no need to you know, show you that you can do symbolic manipulation by writing out the correct equation. All right, okay, so here we'll stop. Uh, so let's take a break right now. Then we'll come back. We'll look at things like speed control and uh, protection. Still, what happens if you have a short circuit fault in type three? Okay, so let's take a break. We'll come back at uh, 9 30. Okay, all right. So uh, before going on with the uh, type three speed and protection, <clears throat> Okay, remember there is a, a EIC scholarship right out there. So for all the undergrad students, they're definitely encouraged to apply. Okay, so because we haven't been awarding that for the past few quarters, so this quarter we want to make 10 of them, so a bit more than past, okay? So a good chance this quarter. Okay. Yeah, so these, this, again, the scholarship is paid by local utilities to encourage people to stay in the power and energy space. And there's no citizenship or any requirement like that. So for all the folks who can apply, should definitely apply for that. Okay, so, all right. so with that is, so let's now talk about speed control, right? So up to until now for type three, what we've been talking about is uh, basically, you think about type three as sort of normal operation, right? What happens when everything's normal? Right? You have some down power, you, you, you want to supply develop power, you have some you know, changing speed, things like that. So speed control is something you'll see more and more of. And really this is, so if you think about the wind turbine space, so what is still new happening, right? What are these still new innovations being made? It's sort of in this space of speed control. So what speed control means is, if you think about the, how the turbine, how the generator behaves, a generator, the speed of the generator depends on the difference of two things. So this is the mechanical torque. So this comes from wind. Okay, this comes from wind, right? This is, you know, this is the mechanically how much power goes into a gearbox. This is the torque that comes out into the grid. So this goes, you can think of this goes to some load. This is sort of the power. Uh, sort of out of the turbine, out of the generator. Okay. So where does it, so if they are not the same, what happens is this torque has to go somewhere. And the somewhere the torque goes is they change the speed of the generator. Okay. So if you're putting more torque than the torque that's coming out, this has to increase. If you're putting less torque than the torque goes the, coming out, this has to decrease. Okay, so this is called the speed of the generator. And this is a very common equation you'll see a lot in power systems. This sort of swing equation, actually. This is sort of the, the form of the swing equation. Uh, this will swing as a difference of the torque coming in and coming out. Okay. So what blows off your generator? Well, it's, if this keeps on increasing, your generator blows off. Okay, so this is a differential equation, right? If this, if this is sort of consistently non-zero, there's a problem, your generator. Okay, your speed is changing quite dynamically. So you do not want a positive 
entirely positive or entirely negative acceleration in this. Right? You want to keep the acceleration. You know, sometimes you accelerate, but often you want you know, this thing to be fairly constant, fairly zero. You want this to be fairly close to zero. Okay, so there's the big machine that you do not want to just accelerate it. All right, so constant speed operation is basically a way to keep this derivative zero. A constant speed operation means I do not want omega two to change. This is the speed of the generator. I don't want this to change. Constant speed means this is zero. So if you look at this equation, how do you make sure the right hand side is zero? Well, so TM varies, so TM changes. And again, there's not much you can do about this. Okay. At least right now, TM comes from when. And when to blow at faster speed, when there's a faster speed, right? When there's a fast higher velocity. So that's what you, you cannot do. Okay. So then what happens then what, so how do we make sure that the speed is constant? So what does the injective voltage do? Okay. So I want to, so TM will change. But then I don't want the generator speed to change. So I want no net torque on the generator. So what does the injective voltage do? See, so I don't want to really change that. I want the generator to be, see, I, so TM, the mechanical torque into it changes. But then sorry, I don't want the generator to see that. I guess I don't want to re I don't want speed to change. I don't want to respond to that. So what does the injective voltage do? So how does type three solve this problem? Right. So what it does is you have a second path. So the addition of power or torque comes out the second path, comes out the converter path. Now the generator has, right? So here the total thing to remember is type three has two ways power can go. So you don't, if you want to keep the generator isolated, then any extra will go through the power electronic cell. Right? So that's what type three, how type three works. Is, hey, look, right? if you don't want, right? So you have a generator. Well, so this is grid. This is your power electronics. Right, so this is your power electronic circuit. You have a capacitor. Okay. So if you want the generator to stay the same, so you want this speed to keep constant, if you have additional power from wind, it goes out of this path. Conversely, if I have less power from the wind, you can send in power from this path. It also keeps this thing constant. Okay, so the power can flow. So this path gives you a way to keep the generator speed fairly constant. What that does is now you can use a smaller gearbox. You put less mechanical stress on the gearbox. So if this thing was gonna break, this, okay, there's two ways this thing will break. Most commonly is the gearbox here will break. Okay, so you have a turbine, so you have a gearbox, So this gearbox is the most likely thing that will break. This is the hardest thing to make. This thing that requires the most maintenance. There's a lot of you know, large moving parts and so on. So if I can shift some power this way, we can do is compare a type three to type two, you can get away with a smaller gearbox, more reliable gearbox. You have a more reliable gearbox. It's in power through this way. This path is less likely to break, except this compass. So if you're really into circuit design, this capacitor is a problem. Okay, so we're gonna ignore this. This capacitor at least is better than the gearbox. Although it's a problem, it's better than this gearbox. Okay, so you send power through this path. So it keeps this generator. So from this generator perspective, the net torque into it is constant. Okay, so that's where power directly flows between the two. Okay, so that's a constant speed operation. So it keeps your generator at a constant speed without it speeding up or spinning, uh, slowing down. Any questions? This is for constant speed operation. 
Okay, so before, okay, so this is constant speed operation. You can also, of course, operate on variable speed, right? You say, okay, I want to you know, increase my power, right? Let's say the grid needs more power, I want to increase more power. Okay, so now what you can do is, you can sort of from the grid, you can inject additional torque. You can now change the amount of torque going through your generator to speed up or slow it down. If you want to speed up, you can inject voltage by speeding up, slowing down. But this gives you a very flexible way of controlling the speed of this generator. Okay, so by changing the power flow along this branch and the comparing to the power coming out of the gearbox, you can dynamically change the speed coming out of the generator. Right? And that's governed by the uh, torque equation. And so basically, this is a differential equation you want to solve. You have some control over TD through the electronic path. And you can control where the speed goes. Either stays constant or go to a target or, or go to some target that you want. So again, this is much more flexible than added resistance. Because added resistance, because the resistance is always positive, there's a lower bound to what you can do. Okay, you can sort of, you know, you can slow it. You can there's sort of you don't have a as flexible control of TD. Here, because you have a polytronic path, the full control of the magnitude and the angle, they're pretty flexible controlling TD. They have very flexible control on speed. Right, so this is a way to make a wind turbine look a little bit more like a traditional generator. Right, something that can control its speed, something that can control its top. Okay, so that's okay, so the variable speed. So one thing, so right now, so this is what we have in the field today. So right now, a lot of attention is being paid to a way to borrow power from wind. We have this kind of idea. It's, for all of this, the assumption is wind will do whatever the wind does. So wind has additional power input. Now, of course, you can either send that power through, through the grid with some additional path or dump that power, you really need to dump the power. The issue is, what if you're a wind turbine and the grid asks for more power than that's actually in the wind? Is there a way to get that out of the turbine? I said, wind is really slow, but the grid still wants that power. Can you get that out? Either mechanically or electrically? Sorry, can you change the? Mm -hmm. Right. But fundamentally, where does the power come from? Right? So there's not enough power in wood. The grid needs more power. Is there a way to borrow this power? Is there a way to? Right, so that's one way actually being sort of very actively invested. And if the wind has less power, you can artificially slow down the generator. That, again, that store momentum, right? Has to, angular momentum has to go somewhere. And that can be dumped to the grid. So the question is, once you slow it down, you have to speed it up again. And the hope is if the grid only needs power for a few seconds, so this is frequency support, you can now borrow power, mechanical power, there's many ways to do it. Right? You can slow the spinning speed, you can sort of pitch the blade all the way to gain sort of power using the mechanical storage you have, dump that to the grid. And then when this sort of, you know, when the need for frequency support passes, then charge back off. Then get the power back off from it. So this will allow you to do it for a short amount of time. Then there's a lot of proposal adding storage. So we'll have storage, instead of going taking the battery directly to the grid, pumping to battery, having battery to grid. The storage though, the storage really is a way to control the mechanical power in the turbine. So by taking some power, you can sort of you know, slow down your turbine quite a bit, use that to give power to the grid, and then storage can maintain your turbine at a slower speed. There's a lot of ways of doing, there's a lot of proposals there right now. So that's, that's sort of getting fairly fancy, all this control method. Right, so, before, again, this is really saying that, well, the most you can do is generate the power that's in the wind. Right? 
there's a way to get that. But then nowadays, there can, you can sort of temporarily borrow power because you have this huge spinning machine. Right? There's a lot of stored energy in this momentum. Right? Remember, these things are bigger than you know, 0.747. They're spinning quite a bit of energy there. The way it's borrow in an intelligent way, such that your turbine doesn't entirely cut off from the grid. So that's really the trick. You can borrow the power. You don't want to store it on too much. Now your induction machine and the grid desynchronize. Right? If they don't synchronize again, then that's a problem. But that's that's where a lot of active work is going on here. Okay. So if you work in the wind power space again, most of a lot of things that start to happen around for this control, especially if you add a little bit of storage. How do you control all these things to make sure so you really appear to the grid as a good generator? And a lot of times you can do this better even than a traditional synchronous generator. A traditional synchronous generator may not have this huge spinning mass. Right? Blades are really big. <laughs> we remember in the earlier part, we said blades are really, really big. The benefit is that they are storage devices. They're spinning, they have momentum. They store a tremendous amount of power. Right? So they're a way to get this out of the blades. So that's, uh, that really gets sophisticated. The uh, control diagrams, the blocks are really big. So we're not gonna you know, touch really talk about that. But I think it's something to keep in mind. Okay, so the generator designed by itself, so nothing is happening inside this circle, this generator. It's very, very unlikely we'll get a better generator. If we ever, you know, we have sort of, yeah, very unlikely. If we have no room temperature superconductors, maybe. But other than that, you're not gonna get a button, better generator. It's what's around this that's more exciting. We're engineering around the generator. All right, so this is the speed operations. So next, let's look at protection. Okay, so protect still, fault happens. You know, you may still have to dump excess power. Right, so where does the excess power go? Okay, so there's sort of, and this protection really is, so because you always have a path, right? This thing can, you have a turn of path, you can go through the solid state electronics. Okay. So then with protection, now we have to care about, okay, what if you know, for that pathway of current flow, what are the limits through the second path? Right? There's some limit to how much power you can flow through solid state converters. So we could dump power through a solid state, that's fine. Right? If you have a fault on this sort of stator to the grid connection, you could go through the other path to get rid of power, that's fine. But now we have to think about, you know, don't burn, right? Don't burn out your uh, solid state conductor. Don't burn out solid state semiconductor. Okay? So all this is basically comes down to how much heat can they tolerate. Right, power has to go through them, it will generate heat. You don't want to generate too much heat for this device. And these are again, sort of power converters. These are not microelectronics, it's power converters. So they're pretty robust. They can sort of tolerate quite a bit. Okay. So, but again, you don't want excess heat. The, okay. So all of this now, again, there are sort of other things we need to think about. There's a junction temperature, you don't want too much heat. Again, you don't want to search current. Searching current is a problem for all devices. If the current is too large, you either touch a limit or you trigger protection embedding some device. Okay, so you, you worry about search current. Then what you worry about is you don't want this number to change too much. So you don't want the DIDT. You don't want the current. You cannot have a very high absolute current. You also don't want a very high rate of change of current. Why is this? Where do you see this DIDT equation? In solid state, in, in circuits? Okay. Right. right, for inductors, right? So inductors opposes this change. If you force the inductor to undergo high rate of change, then bad things happen in your circuit. Okay, so we have we have big power electronics. I need big inductors for filtering all that. 
But then they put a limit on how much this can change. You don't want to violate this. Right? You don't want to fight against the inductors. Similarly, you don't want to fight against a capacitor. Yeah, so you want to limit all those things, right? There are, so power electronics are not, you know, again, they're not uh, perfect devices. You cannot just arbitrarily change active reactive power through them. You have to obey all these constraints. Right? The absolute current constraints, the change of rate of change constraints in both current and voltage. So protection, now protection, uh, there's sort of main type of protection, two main type of protection. One is protecting against over current and over voltage. So this means don't short out right, your power electronics. Do not send a current search through power electronics. Do not send a voltage search across power electronics. You will short them out. Another is more similar to what we have seen before, as they just have more wind power than electric power. Then you have to really get rid of power. This way. Okay. So you have this is where you have dumb power. This is don't short your electronic devices. Okay. Oh, so that's this is sort of the boulder fault we have seen before. Right. So you have connect to the grid, you have a lighting strike on the line, you can't send power to the grid, but when is still coming. Right. So that that's sort of that's the second type. So this we always we always have this problem in wind turbines. This you really don't care about in type one, type two. There's nothing to short in type one, type two. You can't short it. But now you have converters you care about over current over voltage in type three. Yes. Any other questions? Okay. So this is. Again, okay, electrical protection is you have a rotor side converter connect to the rotor. Right? So the rotor don't care all that much about current and voltage surges. It's just a why. That will survive this far. As a converter, that may fail. Okay, the power electronics may fail, so you want to limit that. And again, electrochemical, uh, sorry, yeah, electromechanical protection is if your grid has a fault. You cannot deliver power, but when is you know when is still there, then you have to again you have to dump power. <laughs> you have dump power. So these are two different types of protection we're going to talk about. So let's look at electrical protection first. Okay, this is the where we want to limit current and voltage. You want to limit current and voltage of any surges that may happen. So one is called a crowbar. One is called a chopper. Uh, they're pretty, you'll see why they're called that. The names are pretty descriptive. <laughs> this is uh, how you will protect against them. Okay. So crowbar system is really pretty intuitive. What crowbar does is, right, so what you're afraid of is, let's say, there are some current search, right? you have too much current flowing through this path. I need to this current to go somewhere else. I really want the current to go somewhere else. Where does it go? Let's just collect some resistors for this current to go to. Okay, so this is where the resistors come in. I think all of these things, we still have resistors. It's just that uh, you know, here it's protecting against this current. So what? So if you have a current, see so there's a current divider. You can go here or go here. You want to divide some current through this one. So again, these are SCRs. So if you set a triggering angle, they're never off, then this doesn't exist. You set some trigger angles, this is on, then some current has to flow through this path. Okay, so this is just all adding resistors in parallel to this rotor side converter. To make sure that if you detect, let's say, a surge here, you can trigger all these SCRs, then some power or current will go this way. Okay, so. Questions about the conceptual setup? Okay, so the equations will be similar. Right? You control the triggering angles, figure out how much you want. Yeah. Right, so you never not have a resistor in the circuit. You always have some resistors in your circuit. Again, they're there to handle those kind of surges. Okay, so resistors are still useful in the circuit. They get rid of this uh, surges and... Uh... Okay, so... 
what the crowbar system does, right? What the crowbar system does is, so you think about this as, let's say I have a fault. Okay, let's say I have a fault. So what this does is, let's say I have a fault on the grid. So the grid has a fault on the, so let's say you have a three phase to ground fault. Then this voltage becomes zero because there's no volt, the ground, this is grounded on this, right? This becomes zero. Then what you're afraid of is this voltage is higher than this voltage. And then you force current to flow, but there's nothing here on this side. The grid has fault, and you don't want current to flow on this side. So you don't want to trigger this converter. Okay, you don't want to sort of trigger this converter, force a high current or force a high voltage here. So what you want to do is you want to make sure that this looks like a very small resistance for you. So the current gets diverted through this path rather than going through your converter here. Okay, so you want the current flow here, not here, to protect you against sort of you know current flow when you have a short at the grid. No, no, these are not ground. <laughs> yeah, so you don't ground these. These are just for three phase resistors. Yeah, so they can come. So these are three phase resistors. Normally there you want to appear as if it's not there. But then here again you want uh, you want to divert power first, right? So you activate the crowbar circuit, you block the triggering of the rotor side converter, and uh, they prevent high current flow. Right? If the current can have another path to flow. So this is very similar to what we had before, right? As dynamic braking resistances. But remember what we had before, the dynamic braking resistance, right? So in the whole work as you did this, you computed this resistance values. It's very similar to that idea. As you turn this on, provide a temporary pathway, okay? This is normally not active for very long. Okay, because you don't want to melt these resistors. The issue is you don't want to melt these resistors. So you only activate this for a few seconds. Then if this fault has cleared, you're okay. Everything flows back. If fault has not cleared, you open up all this circuit breakers and entirely isolate the system. So why would a fault, so, right? So this is going a little bit you know, tangent, but think of as a fault. Right, so why would the fault clear in two seconds? Uh, what kind of fault clears in two seconds? What kind of fault doesn't clear in two seconds? Or, okay, so there's transient switching, that's why, that's why. So, okay, so let's think about, okay, what fault doesn't clear in two seconds? Like what? Will be a fault that never clears, but it doesn't clear in two seconds. That's often after this. But let's say there's not a blackout. If the entire grid collapses, then sure, I think it's gone. But I say locally, what kind of fault will you know, keep more than two seconds? No. Right, so two seconds is down line. Like your line is actually dead, right? There's no physical connection. Then what you see is the line will touch ground. So down line, that never looks like open. The line will touch somewhere. Normally the line touches ground or a tree or something. And that's create a short circuit. So you offer this for two seconds, but normally it's not enough to clear it. Okay? So you have the isolate system. So what can clear in two seconds is all very often what happens we have a line, especially when we have high wind, it sort of will get close to a tree and sort of touches it. Uh, but because it's sort of, they're swimming back and forth, it gets close enough to the tree, they become actually a couple. So you think you have a ground, you discharge through a tree. But then they can swim back and you, you disconnect from the tree. This often happens what happens for the fur line. Or this has happened when somebody drove a large truck under a line, and then it thinks it has a coupling to ground. But then that passes through, it doesn't have a coupling. So this it's very common to have fault that's less than two seconds. That's guys clear. And you don't want to entirely isolate the system because if you entirely isolate the system, 
Because what happens is so your wind turbine has to stop, right? You have to stop. Every, you have to discharge all the active elements. You have to discharge the inductor, compressor, all that has to discharge. Then we want to turn that back on. It takes some time for you to turn that back on. Your wind turbine has to start up again. You have to make sure you have to limit the inrush current. You have to make sure you synchronize the speed. So that takes a while. So very often what you want is you want to rise through this types of fault. You want to survive this type of fault for long enough that you don't need to restart the turbine again. Okay. That's two types of fault. And another common cause for something that's short is a lightning fire. So if a lightning fire happens, you detect high current on the line. So all the breakers are temporarily open, but then that dissipates in a fraction of a second. Then you can close again. Okay. But from the wind turbine, we'll see as a short. Okay. So those are the faults that happen sort of, it doesn't happen very often, but uh, can happen very often. Yeah. So how often do you have to replace them? Uh, very often. So if they operate for a bit, you need to swap them out. Yeah, these are, so, have, so okay, let me ask you, if you have a resistor, so these resistors are typically small, like you want high current. So for, let's say you have a 0.5 ohm resistor, how big are those? Is anyone using a 0.5 ohm resistor? No, the higher the resistance, the smaller it is actually. So for a 0.5 ohm resistor, it's about this big. So you push it around. You have a car, you push it around. It's a cylinder about this big. And uh, somebody pushes it around and they put it there. A lot. I push it around as well. <laughs> Oh yeah, oh yeah, that's for quite some time. So that's why maintenance is not easy, but honestly. Yeah. There's an easy housing, actually. A lot of time it's in the housing. That's why it's very heavy. So all of this is big and heavy. That's a cool bus. Yeah, so there's a big resistors and uh, you want to replace it. Again, they're just key things. You don't want on the ground because then the wiring becomes a bit too complicated on the ground. You want this to be fairly close to the rotor. So, and uh, depends. So you can do it. Uh, yeah, so a lot of times the wiring is very close, very close to the rotor. No, the induction, yeah. So because at least the rotor side converter, you want to be very close. The rotor side, you want to be quite close. Because if it's long, then this circuit starts to dominate the system. Uh, these are wires. They used to have resistance, have inductance, all this is here. This will start to dominate your circuit. Then your voltage starts to look weird when you have a secondary voltage. It's just not a new voltage anymore. It's a voltage after this circuit, then gets injected to the rotor. So your, your, X, your X2 prime, R2 prime are not on the rotor anymore. It gets added by this line. And if this line is significantly longer than the rotor, which is very possible for a 100 meter tall wind turbine. Then this dominates the rotor. You have the, then the, the parameters become too high for the rotor. So you want at least this to be fairly close. Then the grid side converter can be a little bit further away. So you can potentially even all collect them together if you want, but this needs to be fairly close. You don't want this circuitry to to dominate the rotor. Okay. Yeah, they're set. Yeah, they're set. So they have a feedback mechanism. And typically, this is manually set. So it's the table, the lookup table. If, it, if this happens, do this. If this happens, do this. There's a lookup table in there. Yeah. So never it measures both voltage and current. You look at you have a lookup table, and you see what happens. Yeah. 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 So this, this is this actually. Yeah, so there's the fault protection, there's this, there's this. Now, right now, it's a table. Again, there's a lot of work to make this more intelligent. Uh, there's quite a bit of work of, you know, using AI to do this. Uh, not sure if that's practical, but there's still a lot of people trying to improve on this. But right now, this is manually designed. Uh, you simulate what can happen. You program this protection circuit for all the things you think will happen. Okay, good. All right, okay, good. So this is a crowbar.
protection system. Again, most comes because you just don't power there. So we're not going to do the equation calculations because that uh, gets too complicated. Yeah, so there's a reason why there's crowbar, but then the three phase becomes really important in the crowbar calculation. And you need a DQ transform to do this. Okay, so we're not going to do that. Instead of uh, what we're going to look at is there's another system called the chopper system. Okay, so the chopper, what the chopper system does is now it's a system in between the two converters. Okay, so there's another way to do protection is if you have a fault, you basically, you want to isolate this two sides. You can either do this isolation in front of the rotor side converter, or you can do it in the middle. It's okay, just as long as you isolate this side, it's okay. And the reason you have to isolate this side, a lot of it comes down to, you want to save this capacitor. A lot of times there's, after the gearbox, this is the critical thing in your system. And you want to save this big capacitor you have in your system. Okay? So you don't want to damage this capacitor. So either isolate it here in crowbar, or as a chopper, you isolate it in between these two. And the idea again is very simple. If you know there's a fault, I don't want power to go through this capacitor, let's open up another bridge to isolate the system. Okay? So these are the two strategies we have for isolation. Any questions about this? Yes, right. So why would you want to use something like circuit breaker? Right. Because you know, you want to add these extra power for current. Right. But it also seems like you can just, I don't know, maybe you have a circuit breaker that could isolate them. Right. Yeah. So the circuit breaker is a more permanent solution. So after two seconds, after two seconds, there'll be a circuit breaker along this line that just open. I think we'll just open. Circuit, the problem with circuit breakers is you cannot open and close them very fast. So this is sort of a temporary solution. So you hope you don't have to use it. But if the fall lasts for a long time, then you open your circuit breaker. Yeah. Yeah. Much faster than circuit breaker. Yeah. Yeah, also, right. So circuit breaker, yeah. So circuit breaker is a mechanical switch. Yeah, you open, right? There's, you pull it out, okay, yeah. And uh, again, circuit breaker, you don't want to pull right away. Because what happens, you have an energized line and you pull circuit breaker, arcs. <laughs> so you don't want to arc it. So you have to wait a little bit at least to trip that. So all this is trying to survive before you need to trip a circuit breaker. So that's a good question. Because there are a lot of circuit breakers that are not drawn. Oh, it happens every time. Like, I'm pretty sure during this class, there's like five faults like this in our grid. Yeah, it happens all the time. Yeah. So, like that, if you look at the, if you actually look at the frequency plot of the grid, like every hour you see something like this. Or go away. Every hour you see something like this. Like something happened in the grid. Yeah, so that, that this happens very often. Again, this capacitor you want to say, because this costs a lot of money. A big, we're not very good at making big capacitors. These things are very costly. They're not all that reliable. So do not, you know, just don't break this capacitor. You break this capacitor, there's uh, you know, a lot of money on this capacitor. Resistors are okay. This is cheap. This is more expensive. That's yeah. Oh, no, no, the capacitor is really expensive. Converters are not as expensive. Like this capacitor is by far, like if you look at power electronic circuits, especially high power applications, you almost always limit it by your capacitor. Like the, the your biggest capacitor is always no, normally the limiting factor, either for reliability or power or something like that. If I could have ideal capacitors, like if we have ideal capacitor, you solve a lot of circuit problems. You solve every isolation problem in the world. You put ideal capacitors. We don't. So a lot of us, you know, this is a very, yeah, you want to protect this device. Do not, don't kill the capacitor. So a capacitor is important. So a chopper system is to sort of, you know, protect the capacitor. All right, so we're not, again, not going to do too much equations on the chopper system. 
because it requires your competitive you know, differential cal equation calculations, but just get the idea across. Okay, so any question about type three? Really? So again, for midterm, we'll, we'll not touch reactive flowers. So we'll cover to end of last class. Right? We'll go from end of Tuesday's class. So we, we won't be looking at, you know, how do you, in today's question, how do you compute VA to keep everything cost? That's still a little bit hard. Right? So we'll keep it to end of Tuesday's class for a midterm. This will definitely show up you know, on the final, but uh, or in the next homework you'll see. Right, so any other thing? Okay, sure. Let's see. This? Yeah. 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 Right. Right, so what this means is this converter looks at this voltage. And what you don't want to do is you don't want to have a very high voltage here. Because if you have high voltage, this converter thinks there's no fault. This converter thinks the whole thing is going okay. And I should have a voltage difference. And I should float how. So the way that, so this converter, right? So there's a fault happens. How does this kind of push to fault? At this point, right? how does it know this has a default? So the way it has a, so this will be activated if there's a significant voltage difference. We'll think, okay, there's some voltage. I should convert the voltage right, to the gray side. So to make sure this, so this has a protection device building. So if the voltage is very low here, don't do conversion. Keep it off. So this lowers the voltage this converter sees on on the front end. Uh, so you have a short circuit here. This will be uh, show up as an over voltage here. Oh. This is this, this how the fall will show up here. Yeah. yeah, so good. So yeah, so there's not explicit communication of something telling this converter I have a fault on the line. Right? The way this converter figures out is it measures this input voltage. If it's too low, don't trigger, or don't convert. Keep all the voltage, keep all, don't switch, basically. And that, it knows this because this will activate. So this thing measures the current flow here. That's driven by there's a fault, and this will activate. So the, yeah, the only information this thing to measure are voltage and current. It's not explicit. Mean, for this? For this converter or for over, over the crowbar? Oh, the voltage for it. So normally the voltage is not important. Normally is the current. So the current can be quite high. Thousands of amps can be quite high. Yeah. Could be a high current. So because you have I square R loss. So really what's, you have a fixed R value. So what's limiting you is I square. Value, right, so thermally you can tolerate some I square R power for a certain amount of time. And then that gives you a limit on the current your crowbar can tolerate. All right, so this is uh, type three. So next class or after the midterm, we'll go on to type four, which is actually dramatically simpler than type three. <laughs> this is about as complicated as we'll get for winter. Okay, so good luck uh, on the midterm. Actually.